Why this variancy? Of course, there's a reason for that. When you look at the whole evolution of the Greek manuscripts, you look at the Greek editions that are basically constructed today, you look at the variances, these can obviously be explained uh, by the latest development in modern scholarship. Ellen G. White, who is a prophetess in the Seventh-day Adventist movement, in a Bible commentary, volume 1, page 17, she says, page 14, the Bible we read today is the work of many copyists who have not been infallible. And God most evidently has not seen fit to preserve it altogether from error in transcribing. I had seen that in certain instances, God had especially preserved the Bible. That's what she says. Yet, in certain instances, learned men had in some instances changed the words, thinking that they were making it plain, when in reality they were mystifying that which was plain by causing it to lean to the established views which were governed by tradition. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they produced the New World Translation. The Orthodox, they don't accept that. Why not? Because they've changed the words. According to their own leanings, what you'd say, their own understanding, they've adopted and changed and amended. But this is someone who believes in the authenticity of the Bible. That's a confession she makes. And of course, you have a description of God, which I won't go into detail, because certain instances it becomes polemical. But some of the descriptions, for example, in 2 Samuel 22 verse 11, you read the descriptions, there's smoke going out of his nose and devouring flames. He rode upon a cherub, which is a childlike angel and so on. Some of the descriptions that, you, that are describing God, it can be understood. I'm not saying laugh at it. I'm not saying laugh or mock. I'm saying it evolved in a context that it reflects the idiosyncrasies of the communities at that particular time when they were writing these manuscripts. Hence they had certain ideas. They had ideas of God as a man, God being subjected to uh, certain sensory perceptions and so on and so forth. In certain instances influenced by pagan ideologies. It's not a reason to mock, but of course a reason to explain that look, in certain instances there's an anthropomorphic concept of God which is not evident in the Quran. We don't have anthropomorphism in respect of God. God is uh, described as omniscient, as omnipotent and so on, but you do not have him having human characteristics, human-like attributes and so on. Then you have um, things, for example, which has been cause for concern, like the Amalekite massacre in 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 3, about an incident which Amalek did to Israel some 400 years ago, and the commandment given to Amalek. Um, you see, because that's a problem. That, that is a main problem I have, is that again and again you have the idea, well, the Quran speaks about violence. The Quran proclaims violence. Where? Show me. And they'll give you quotations. Surah 8 verse 60, Surah 9 verse 5, or Surah 47, Surah Muhammad. But you look at them, you look at the example. I'll give you one particular example, which I've seen um, recently. Um, um, it was probably on YouTube or one of the other uh, particular um, uh, scenes that are basic. One of those noted individuals, it's, and he gives a quotation and he stops there. And he, this is what he says. He says, he reads this and he says, well, you see, this book, it teaches Muslims to basically uh, kill and to murder and to fly planes into buildings and so on. And he gives this quotation. Look what he says. He says, hence make ready against them, at verse 59, and let them not think, those who are bent on denying the truth, that they shall escape God. Behold, they can never frustrate his purpose. Then in the context of warfare, it says, Hence, make ready against them whatever force and steeds of war mounts you are able to muster, so that you might, you might deter thereby the enemies of God, who are your enemies as well. And so this particular evangelist stops there. As if the verse ends there, that's it. He sees nothing else. But look at the context. It says, and others besides those of whom you may be unaware, but of whom God is aware. And whatever you may expend in God's cause shall be repaid to you in full and shall not be wrong. Verse 61. But if they incline to peace and desist from their aggression. In other words, they are the aggressors. So if they desist from their aggression, then incline thou to peace as well. And place thy trust in God. Verily he alone is all hearing and all knowing. So you see, the problem I have is that they quote the Quran, that's good, but they do it badly, that's a problem. 
You quote the Quran badly. And when you quote the Quran badly, you do the same that the extremist does. And you find the extremists in Muslim circles, you find the fanatics in Christian circles, they do the same. You're on par. You're on par with them because you bastardize scripture. You divorce it out of its context. So you just quote Surah 9 verse 5. Slay them, smite the unbelievers. You stop there. Look at the context, what does it say? And you contrast that to what you have here in the Amalekite massacre. Am I quoting out of context? Is that what God said? Was the Amalekite massacre a moral atrocity? Was it or was it not? Or was it something which basically never took place? Or maybe something which uh, the Jewish community is raised to demonize other people, to demonize the Amalekites and so on and so forth. Then you have, of course, scientific problems. Um, in Psalms uh, 102 um, to 25 to 26 and Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10 to 11, it speaks about the earth and heaven shall perish. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 4, earth and heaven shall abide forever. Earth has pillars in Job chapter 9 verse 6 and Psalms chapter 75 verse 3. Maybe that's metaphorical. Maybe it's not meant to be taken literal. Maybe I'm misreading it. Perhaps it could be the case. But if you go on there, and, and this is commonly used, you see, because in, in Surah Baqarah, I've seen Orientalists use this as a target where they state that, look, menstruation is a pollution. So therefore, it means that um, a woman should be ostracized from their societies and so on. Again, they're doing it out of context. You look at the context, ask me a question time, we'll go through the verse. But look at this example here which is a development from the sacerdotal text in Leviticus chapter 12 verse 1 to 5 it says if a woman conceives and bears a male child she is unclean for seven days but on the other hand if she conceives a female child she is unclean for 14 days so why is it that when a male child is born she is unclean just for seven days when a female child is born she is unclean for 14 days is there something about femininity that makes them impure or as a psalmist would state, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So maybe childbirth is a form of sin. Or when God says unto the woman, He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt conceive, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. Of course, we accept the story of Adam and Eve, but we do not believe that Eve was the cause of the fall. We believe both sin. Both were basically ejected from whatever state they were in. Both asked for repentance. Both were forgiven. Because Adam, millions of years ago, did not ask you whether you ate, uh, were permission for him to eat the, uh, the, the, the apple from the tree. So why should you be held responsible? Did he tell you? Did he ask you, can I eat it? And did you give him permission? So why should you be held accountable for what he did? If he ate an apple, if there was an apple, or if an apple is something which is symbolic, something which is metaphorical, for something which is beyond common perception. But how does one explain this? Menstruating woman. In Leviticus chapter 15 verse 19, it says, If a woman menstruates, she shall be put apart for seven days, and anyone who touches her or linen or sits in a chair shall be unclean till the evening, even though he bats her thereafter. Now, Someone may say, well, look, these are laws of the Old Testament. These are laws that basically evolved in a particular context. We are living under grace. It doesn't apply to us today. But the question is that, do, does one believe? The question is not whether the laws apply to us or whether we no longer need them. Does one believe that at a particular point in time, if the morality of God, if the um, um, justice that God promulgates, if that, is that consistent? Or does God waver in his consistency? Does he prescribe laws in certain aspects of history which are inconsistent with justice, which are inconsistent with his uh, divineness, with his omniscience? Or does he change? Does he chop and change based on the times? That's basically a question we need to ask. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 20. Well, this is speaking about the existence of four-footed fowls or chickens. Some have translated it as insects now. Of course, some may say it's a translation error. I'm not going to waste my time too much on that. I'll take it for granted. Maybe it's a translation error. Creatures of mythology. In Isaiah chapter 7, 34, verse 7. Now, Isaiah is a book where, where there can be aspects of, of metaphor. I don't have a problem with that. 
allegory or, or parables can be given. But here you find descriptions of unicorns shall come down upon them and the bullocks with their bulls. And you know that today the concept of unicorns is something which is mythic in origin. Something you'd find in Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, for example, or the Chronicles of Narnia and so on. Which uh, by C.S. Lewis, in fact, the Chronicles of Narnia was greatly influenced uh, because in a sense many people have stated that the Chronicles of Narnia is in a sense a, a parable of uh, Christian um, um, ideas and views and so on, but that's another debate on its own. But maybe that's a kind of an inspiration for her, C.S. Lewis. Shape of the earth is flat. In three accounts, Matthew chapter 4 verse 8 and Luke chapter 4 verse 5, the devil takes Jesus to an exceedingly high mountain and shows him all the ends of the world. Now, maybe again, devil as I believe, maybe something which is symbolic, not necessarily a literal understanding. But this description can only be possible if the world is flat. In Daniel 6 verse 10, a tree goes up to the ends of the earth and can be seen from all the ends of the earth. Again, only possible if the earth is flat. Not if the earth is spherical. Zoology, we won't deal with this too much, but these are points which are scientifically unacceptable. Then we have something called the bitter water test for adultery, Numbers chapter 5, verse 11 to 31, where in certain instances, if the priest shall bring a person who is accused of adultery, and so he shall take some holy water in some clay jar and put some dust in the water, and once she drinks it, if her thigh rots and her abdomen swells, then she is defiled and she'll be accursed amongst people. Now, I can accept, I can accept that this particular ruling is something which is part and parcel of, of, of Jewish law. The Jews could have had these particular laws, they could have had these regulations and these ideas and so on. But the problem is when you attribute these particular ideas to God and say, this is now by divine inspiration. This cannot be by divine inspiration. That's a problem that we have in Islam. Um, you find again another problem, virginity testing. In Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 13 to 18, in an accusation of slander, it speaks about the father shall bring the tokens of the virginity and shall display and spread the cloth to the elders of community as proof and the elders shall punish the slanderer. Of course, the cloth was used to determine the virginity. Now, I do understand there are Christian people in this audience and my aim is not to laugh or to ridicule or to mock any particular people. I'm not saying this is what Christians do or this is what Jews do today. I'm not saying that. I'm not going to use this on a platform to say, well, this is what Christians do and so on. But what I do basically claim is that in a particular context, this also evolved specifically in a specific history. Jewish law, Jewish tradition, not divinely inspired and so on. Historical problems. In all four Gospels after the alleged crucifixion, you have instances about Mary, who did she see at the sepulchre? In Matthew 28 verse 2, she sees an angel. In Mark 16 verse 5, she sees a young man. In Luke 24 verse 4, two men. In John 20 verse 2, 12, she sees two angels. So who did Mary see when she went to the sepulchre? Because these are all four gospel accounts with different ideas, different views, and so on. And so, of course, it stands to reason. We're not questioning Jesus or the authenticity of Jesus because we accept him as one of the mightiest messengers of God. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not accept Jesus. What we do challenge, we challenge to receive tradition, whether it's in the Bible. And of course, if you find something in the Quran which is objectionable, Christians have a right to raise it. If there's something objectionable in the Hadith, you have a right to raise it. And of course, we need to deal with it on a scholarly level. Not to throw stones at each other, but to deal with it maturely and in a specific particular idea. Then you find last year, and I'll end on this particular point when I'm dealing with the Old Testament. In the whole of the Old Testament, you'd find references to books. In Numbers 21 verse 14, it speaks, for example, about the book of the wars of the Lord. It is said in the book of the wars of the Lord. Or it is written in the book of Jasher that the Lord said. Or it is said in the book of the man of the kingdom. Now, these are not apocryphal books. These are books which are mentioned in the Old Testament. You'd find them mentioned in all these particular references. 
But when you look at them, deep down, when you look at them, you basically see that effectively they are not there, they cannot be found. None of them can be found. And lastly, the book of the covenant of Moses in Exodus chapter 24 and 7. Where are these books? They are not to be found there. That raises certain questions which we as people need to ask maturely, where are these particular books? And of course, we all obviously know, this is common knowledge, 73 books in Catholicism and 66 amongst the um, uh, uh, Protestants, the Protestant world. Variant season number of books. Seven more, seven less. One Bible contains seven more books, another Bible contains 66 books. Now, when we deal with the Quran in contradistinction, which is described as the original source from which all principles and ordinances are derived. The name Quran is frequently mentioned in contradistinction. You find it mentioned numerous occasions. You look at the index, I don't have the time to go into that. It identifies itself. It states to whom, why, when, and in what language it was delivered. It was revealed the belief, and of course we'll analyze this, whether it's true. It was revealed to Muhammad over 23 years in Arabic, memorized immediately after revelation, and safely preserved in the memories of the reciters. So, we won't have the problem of manuscripts, of manuscripts uh, being um, defunct and so on. Why? Because in Islamic belief, from inception, you are supposed to memorize the Quran. You use it in your five daily recitations. In Tarawih, in Ramadan, you are supposed to recite the entire Quran from memory, which was a practice conducted by the Prophet Muhammad in Medina. So it was in the mind of the reciters, by reciters, because we believe, as opposed to Christians, Christians believe in a verbal inspiration that men were inspired, tickled in a manner of speaking by the Holy Spirit to write. But in that sense, no two can be identical. We believe in a verbal revelation. That's different. God says, Qul Wallahu Ahad. Say, He is God the one and only. And Muhammad is made to say, Qul Wallahu Ahad. Allahu Samad, God is eternal, the absolute. Muhammad is made to say, Allahu Samad. As if someone is dictating. Christians believe in a verbal inspiration, not a revelation as such. And in Surah 75 verse 17, we see on us rest the collecting and on us rest the preservation. In fact, the standardized version was in existence at the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So there was no problem in respect of that. This is testified by a noted hostile critic on Islam called Sir William Mir. In fact, you look at most of the Orientalist tract on Islam today, most of the hate literature on Islam. It's derived from this man here, William Mir, wrote a critical book called Life of Muhammad on the biography of the Prophet. And he was forced to concede there is probably in the world no other book which has remained 12 centuries, now 14, with so pure a text. William Mayer is made to concede that. These are the Sana manuscripts which were discovered in Yemen. But these manuscripts were discovered in the 70s, what they did in uh, Yemen. I can't recall the actual uh, archaeologists who did that. But this goes back during the years after the Hijra. So if people speak now about not being manuscripts, whether they're manuscripts or no manuscripts, as I stated initially, the Quran was a recitation, preserved by recitation. So for example, in reciting Tarawih today, if I make a mistake in my um, verse recitation, someone corrects me. And so on. That correction was there, so they could always check and counter-check, Hufaz and so on. But even if one had to assume that Leave the recitation aside, leave the preservation. Here you find discovery manuscripts which were discovered in Yemen going back to the first century of the Hijra during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. A European philosopher called Carlyle, on his book on heroes and hero worship, he says, If a book comes from the heart, it will contrive to reach hearts. All other art, author, craft, a small amount of that. One would say that the primary character of the Quran is that of its genuineness, of it being a bona fide book. In fact, the noted Catholic encyclopedia, 
What does the Catholic Encyclopedia say? They say that over the years many theories have been offered in respect of the origins of the Quran. They state, well, it's basically come from Jewish folklore and fables, or it's basically been borrowed by the Bible, and so this was a common view, common perception, common idea. You look at the works of uh, Giga or um, um, you know other such writers like uh, or, you know Samuel Giga or some of these other polemicists, such as George Sale, who was the first translator of the Quran, or Muraki's Latin translation of the Quran. They have the same idea, but yet it's forced to concede. Today, no sensible person accepts them. So, which means that what the argument is that they're not saying the Quran is a word of God. They're not saying that. What they are saying is that the Quran we have here today is the same Quran that we have during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. But they're not saying it's a word of God. We cannot say that what we have today is what was existent in the time of Moses. Biblical scholars don't say that. What we have today was existent in the time of Jesus. Biblical scholars admit it's not. These people are admitting the Catholic Encyclopedia. No sensible person accepts them. What were these theories? The first theory, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, was the author himself of the Quran. Second theory, the Prophet Muhammad obtained it from other sources of religious scriptures. The third theory is that the Holy Quran does not have a divine author, but is from the realm of the divine. And so, when you basically um, look at these different theories, it's important to analyze them in the context and see, let's look at them. First theory, was the Prophet Muhammad the author? The problem with that is that it's highly abnormal. If the Prophet Muhammad was the author of the Quran who had written it, you know, we have references in the Quran which says, Thou wast not able to transcribe it with thy right hand. Most certainly the um, uh, talkers of vanity would have doubted. So it would be highly abnormal to challenge the testimony of a person who disclaims responsibility. If you write a book, would you want to disclaim responsibility? Would you want to say this is not my book? So why would he go out of his way to proclaim this is not his book? Number two, those who stated he was a false prophet, he was a liar, he was a deceptive man in terms of belief, they refused to accept his message, but they continued giving him valuables for safekeeping. Question, if the man was a cheat and a forger, why would you still go and give a cheat and a forger your own valuables for safekeeping, if you're a pagan or an idolater for that matter? Because one of his uh, names was Asad al Amin, the truthful, the honest one. And as far as material gain is concerned, we know from history that he married a rich businesswoman called Khadija when he was 27, she was 40 years old. And during that time, up until 40, he was financially well off, financially secure, financially stable materially well off. After he proclaimed prophet, what happened? He was subjected to economic boycott. He was subjected to basic boycott from the Meccan fraternity. They refused to do business with him, refused to do business with his family, ostracized him from society, and so on. So if he was there for material benefits, what material gains would there be for him? Because his financial position became worse after he proclaimed the prophethood. So if your financial position becomes worse, what's, there, what's in there for you? Unless, of course, you are a prophet. And of course, there are several historical facts which we can't deal with now. I'm looking at John Gilchrist's writings, and you compare that now with the Catholic Encyclopedia. The Catholic Encyclopedia has had a detailed history in terms of engaging in polemic against Islam from time immemorial, from the times of Peter the Venerable and the Great. Yet in the modern Catholic Encyclopedia, they are forced to confess and concede that in the past, many theories have been offered in respect of the Quran. Today, no sensible person accepts them as valid or critical. In fact, comments of, on Giga, you heard of Giga and Tisdall, Reverend St. Clair Tisdall, 
from the uh, 19th to the 20th century. You have, uh, for example, um, uh, a, a Jewish individual called Abraham Giger or Geiger, and these particular individuals were the kind of uh, so-called scholars of polemicists who came up with the ideas of borrowing theories from the Mishnah Sanhedrin, from the Targum, the fact that what we've got here is not a complete Quran and so on. And it's quite strange that many missionaries today rely on these particular... You look at answering Islam by um, Abdul Salim and uh, you look at uh, even the answering Islam website, Sam Shamoon and Joe Chen Katz, so-called website gangsters, and you see the polemics that they engage in. But invariably, most of the sources that they come from date from the 19th and the 20th century. You at liberty to go on at least. I, but the I, I, I don't you share that liberty. No, you've not shared it. You've, you've, made, you've made comments that the Quran has not been codified properly. They're missing manuscripts. It's not chronological. Now, each and every single one of those points requires a lecture. And every, every one of your points to, uh, requires a lecture as well. That's what I'm saying, brother. You're fair. We are going to offer you the opportunity. We will set up a forum. You can come to Durban or we can come to Pretoria or Malaysia and we will meet you on the common platform. Come to my hometown. We've, we, we've already dealt with the Muslim critiques. But, 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 but I, I just want to say something that you just said in your, in your saying. You say no modern scholar has anything to say about the Quran. No, I'm saying. No, I, I mean, we, 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 we don't have Christian scholars. You like the German?